Good morning. Thank you for joining us today for Webinar Wednesday for February 2018. Today, the subject we are looking at is quality in construction. My name is Katie. I'm Digital Communication Specialist here at CABE, and I'll be uh, helping you if there's any issues at all um, on the technical side this morning. If you want to interact with us today, it's um, you can send us any questions on the right hand side or um, perhaps at the top of your screen, depending on uh, how you're viewing us today. You can send in questions, just text-based, so just uh, type those in and we'll pick those up as we go along. If you're watching on perhaps YouTube and you're catching up later, you can still send us any questions. Um, just forward those to info at cbuildy.com and then I will then pass those on to today's presenter to pick up. Um, if you're on Twitter, hashtag CABECPD. So today's presenter, Tony Hopkin. Um, Tony is Technical Projects Manager at NHBC, where he's responsible for assisting in the delivery and implementation of strategies and action plans to maximise NHBC standard raising activities. He's got nearly 10 years experience in construction quality and defects, having worked in various claim roles as a general manager, visiting lecturer and a technical projects manager and has researched de um, defects for his doctorate. He is a Chartered Construction Manager, Chartered Building Engineer, and he is a Fellow of CABE. So if you just give me one moment, I will hand over to Tony, where he will take you through this morning's presentation. Good morning, everybody. So yeah, as Katie said, I am Tony Hopkin, Technical Projects Manager at NHBC. And today I'm going to talk about construction quality, pretty much through through my eyes and also an NHBC lens. So today I'm going to cover various information. So first of all, I'll talk a little bit about who NHBC are and what we do. Then I'll go into detail on the importance of focusing on quality. And myself have learnt. So a little bit about NHBC, we are a standard setting body, so we essentially write the standards that new homes should be constructed to. We're the UK's largest warranty provider, and we've got roughly about 80% of the market share for new home warranties. We're one of the UK's largest approved inspectors for residential purposes. We administer the Home Builder Federation New Home Customer Satisfaction Surveys. We provide training to industry for our training and analysis departments. And we also support the industry with research and guidance. And our ultimate aim, we are there essentially to raise standards to protect homeowners. So the importance focusing on quality. So to start with, what do I mean by quality? For the purposes of this, I'm simply talking about compliance with existing um, standards and requirements. And we know that quality is not where we'd like it to be as an industry. So an example of this can come from the Um, we also know that approximately 41% of homeowners report over 11 defects during that first eight week period. And in addition, we know that warranty providers spend vast sums of money repairing defects under the warranty cover. So knowing that quality is not where we'd like it to be, we've um, developed a new initiative called Construction Quality Reviews. And these are a detailed review of quality on site undertaken by our inspection managers and they'll observe 38 build stages covering foundations to internal finishes and external work. So um, what we look to do on construction quality reviews is understand first of all what went wrong, but also understand why it went wrong. So in order to undertake a construction quality review, our inspection managers, they'll look for a suitable site with the most build stages um, available for review. They'll have a discussion with the site manager, an initial meeting to understand first of all hours on site, looking at areas of, in detail. After, after the review has taken place, they'll have a, uh, a meeting with the site manager to discuss their findings and also offer some recommendations as to how things can be improved. And then a copy of the report that they produce on the day will be distributed to um, the senior managers in the house builder and also the site manager. And then we'll hold some feedback sessions where we'll look to 
we'll hold some feedback sessions where we'll look to um, work with the house builder to hopefully improve quality. Sorry, everybody. I just have noticed I'm having quite a few comments regarding um, sound cutting in and out. I think I've worked out what the problem is. So if there are any issues, again, just keep letting me know. But I think we're solved now. So thank you very much, everyone. There we go. So microphones don't normally pick up my voice. <laughs> so um, when the um, inspection... like a number of significant non-compliances with NHBC standards and building regulations or a potential health and safety concern or a, a large claim. Outstanding is something that exceeds the requirements and pretty much can't be improved. But the areas that we, we mainly find are to do with good and also requires improvement. So, so far we've undertaken about 3,000 construction quality reviews and looked at around 50,000 build stages. So the most, um, the largest area we've looked at is to do with superstructure, followed by first fix, and then substructure and drainage and roofs. And from these, um, the simplest way of looking at this is to compare what can be improved as, um, to that that is correct and can't be improved upon. And we find that superstructure is one of the largest areas where improvements can be made. Substructure and drainage improvements can also be made and roofs and first fix. And then as you go down towards So what we've seen so far is these are the top 10 areas of focus. So the first areas, largest area that we see that can be improved is damp proof courses and cavity trays. Second largest area is cavities and insulation. Third largest area is fire stopping and soundproofing. And then we've got plaster and dry lining to uh, walls and ceilings, waterproofing and ventilation to substructure and drainage, sorry, to uh, suspended floors, uh, the framing of the roof, lintels, beams, and other structural elements, ventilation, underfelt insulation, and fire stopping to the roof, floor deckings, and stairs, soundproofing, and fire stopping, and then finally below ground drainage. So today I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on uh, four of these areas. So damp proof courses and cavity trays, cavities and insulation, fire stopping and soundproofing, and plaster and dry lining to walls and ceilings. So first of all, damp proof courses and cavity trays. What you can see here is there are, there are a number of areas where improvement can be made. So essentially the darker the color, the, the less areas are scored. There we go, is that better? Excellent, so let's try again. Um, interesting, we're having some quality issues with the sound. So, um, yep, areas of focus, damp proof courses and cavity trays. Um, areas where improvements can be made are Wales, Scotland and the Southwest. I, uh, I pick on these particularly because they're in areas of high exposure to wind driven rain as shown in our standards, which you can see here. So if it's wrong here, then the likelihood is it will be exposed and it could result in a claim or a post-completion repair. Um, if you look at the northeast, it's in an area of high exposure, but they're guessing it right more often than they get it wrong. So just thinking generally, are there any lessons that we can learn from this area? And I'm sure that's something that we're going to look at in more detail moving forward. So these are just some of the typical problems that we're seeing. So this first one here is a stop end. It's just folded back on itself. That's not going to work properly. Secondly, that trade's full of mortar, so it's not going to, um, going to work properly, and also it causes issues of potential thermal bridge. And finally, cavity trays here are in the wrong place. They're going to do the exact opposite of what they should be doing. They're actually going to put water into the building. So this is what it should look like. Here's a correctly formed stop end, so this has been built up into a full high perp end. This second picture here, the tray's nice and clear, the stop end's correct, so that should hold water and also dispense it out of the building. 
And here on a what we consider to be a difficult detail, they're using preformed step trays. And you can see this in the right place. So the heel of the tray is against the water line. So that should work correctly. And these are just some of the consequences of, of if you get it wrong. So if you get it wrong, you get water coming into your building. And if you look at the uh, picture on the right, it's that bad that somebody's had to get a saucepan to capture it. Second largest area of focus is to do cavities and insulation. And um, some of the areas that are largest room for improvement are London, the Southeast, Wales, and Scotland. And these pictures are indicative of what we're seeing going wrong on a regular basis. So the insulation detail is wrong here near the cavity tray. In here, you've got um, insulation completely missing. And in this last picture, you can see gaps between the boards. So this is how it should be done. So insulation, it should be continuous. And where you've got trays, it should be cut behind and in front of them. The insulation should be, as in the second picture, nice and tight against the block work. The joints should ideally be taped and tight. There should be no gaps. And the insulation should be fixed using ties. So what happens if you get your insulation wrong? This is an example of a claim that came to us. So gaps in insulation can increase your heat loss by something like 20 to 30%. They also increase your chances of water ingress, and also they can increase your chances of damp and mold, which can also contribute to health issues. Now we've got fire stopping and soundproofing. This is one of the other areas of focus for us. If you see on this, Scotland, it's, um, it's an area of room for improvement, so, but could this be down to the, the use of um, different materials in Scotland? So they use less masonry, so there's typically a higher requirement for different requirements for fire stopping. This is indicative of some of the issues that we see. So here you can see um, gaps in the gaps in the insulation, which can cause cold spots and sound transfer. You've got mortar on the cavity barrier here, which could cause a cold bridge. It could um, increase sound transfer. And if the sock's being used as a fire barrier, it could allow fire and smoke to spread. Similar issues here. There's a nice, uh, nice bit of insulation between the gaps. This is an example of how it should be done. So you can see that the, the fire barrier here is, is nice and tight fitting. There's, there are no gaps. Um, the insulation on the second picture is full. And the barrier on the first picture is also close to the insulation. So you shouldn't really get any cold spots. Plaster and dry lining. Scotland, again, it's um, one of the areas of focus. This is largely to do with the things that we're seeing in the second picture on the next slide. So the, the, one of the largest areas that we see is to do with plasterboard, the wrong type of plasterboard being used in a wet area. So second, we're seeing boards damaged and fixed too close to the edge of the board where they're fixed with screws. And then in this last picture here, there's no continuous band around the opening. So what you should do is um, in wet areas, you should use moisture resistant board and that's typically this sort of aqua kind of blue color. Where boards are screwed, they should be um, securely fixed with screws not less than 13 mil from the cut edge or 10 mil from a bound edge. And then here you should um, have a continuous band provided to perimeter walls or openings, junctions, and around service penetrations. And this um, is to reduce decreased thermal performance. We've also spoke to hundreds of site managers, trades, and senior managers and identified a number of underlying causes for defects. And we found that it's not always the trade's fault. So one of the largest areas that, that we found, one of the largest underlying causes of defects is to do with um, the availability of information. So it's typically stuff such as lack of detail on drawings or no, no information being made available to those who are undertaking the work on site. And this reminds me of when I was on site probably a few months ago now. Um, some ground workers were putting in some ventilation to a suspended ground floor because there was radon in the area. They had no detail showing where to put the vents nor any positions of door openings. And this led them to occasionally put vents in doorways, which meant they were broken out, filled in, so the ventilation requirements weren't being met. So in these sorts of situations, feedback is key. The second one here, supervision. Um, the favorite quote for this on me, for me on this one, is the foreman was on the tool, so he couldn't supervise the work. And that may suggest that, that volume is more important than quality. With regards to communication and responsibility, language barriers is one of the, uh, the biggest areas that we see. So 
is there a potential workaround here? We think that around 20% of workers in the house building industry um, in the UK come from outside the UK and don't have English as a first language. So that was a, a finding of a recent HPF survey. And where people speak very little English, can we refine our site induction processes? Um, can we make information multilingual? Would mock-ups of construction work show and what we expect with regards to quality help overcome any potential language barriers? And also, could we communicate better through drawing? I know that a lot of work has been done on this with regards to health and safety, so can we adopt some of the, uh, the principles on that? One of the other issues is to do with confusion over who's responsible for an element of work. Is there some way that we can make this uh, clearer through, through contractual arrangements? Which leads on nicely to, to the contractual arrangements part. The most interesting one for me here is that the work wasn't in a package. So if it's not in somebody's package, it's the top one there. So it wasn't in the bricklayer's package or the ground worker's package to install fire stopping below damp proof course. If it's in nobody's package, then it's probably not going to get done. Um, also, this the one down the bottom is to do with, with barons. So the use of barons in the experience of the people we've spoken to uh, makes it hard to pin down quality offenders. So there are typically some contractual arrangements that may make it harder to achieve good quality construction. Quality control, a, a few simple themes here. So it's either the quality process is not being followed, and maybe that's because there's not enough time to follow the process because production might take priority. Um, this reminds me of a discussion I had with, with a site manager at the start of this year. Um, he was targeted on a number of properties he completed over a given period. And uh, he, he pretty much got it in the neck for, for missing his volume target, despite smashing his profit one. Other areas of quality assurance, so company quality assurance processes and guides not being suitable for their, for their process. So one of the middle quotes here is that the quality assurance process that the, um, the house builder had didn't cover inspections for blocks of flats. So if you come across something like this, uh, feedback's key, because if you don't feed it back, you don't tell people that the... Um, the current process is unsuitable, then you won't actually get any change. Design changes. Um, design changes, typically a few themes coming through here. So design changes, they're either not communicated to site or they're not communicated to manufacturers, or you've got conflicting details on the same drawing. Um, this will always cause confusion and often it will cause rework, possibly a bit of delay and typically some extra cost. So again, with these sorts of issues, feedback, it is important to make sure that these problems aren't repeated on future builds. Familiarity and knowledge. Um, some of the key things coming through from the people that we spoke to are the lack of awareness on a product, how to install it, and what's required on site. And these, a lot of these themes, they interlink. So um, this particular one here, this links to communication and also availability of information. With regards to continuity of trades, we again get back to Baron-led gangs. So a lot of these comments um, talk about Baron-led gangs and no continuation. It means that it's more difficult to get quality right because there's more focus on getting work completed, possibly getting paid, and then um, moving on to the next job. So just my thoughts on this being slightly cynical. If you're not back tomorrow and you don't have to deal with any poor work of yesterday, then you're probably less likely to get it right. And this, again, it links nicely to the contractual arrangement side of things. With regards to materials, um, I think the robust detail one down the bottom is, is kind of a, a nice summary of what tends to go wrong. So some details, they can't be built as per the design because the right materials haven't been procured and they're not available to those on site. So some drawings, they'll specify a certain material or similar. And it might be that the, the similar ones chosen for certain reasons, and it might not be the right one to achieve the desired requirements. And then with regards to attitude, um, I don't believe that, that many people go to work to do a bad job, but if you, you believe some of these comments, um, sometimes people, they, they don't care what they're doing and they're just at work to get paid. So in these examples, people were, were aware that they were doing stuff wrong, but just continued to work. And then program demands. So 
from these comments, it would appear that completion always takes priority. And also, until um, quality becomes a priority, it typically suffers at times a high volume. So you can see from, um, from some of these quotes that the, the site management team, they were putting pressure on trades to push work on, which could be at the expense of quality, and, and similar things to that. So what there might be is when buildings are nearing completion, you could get focus on um, getting that building over the line, getting it completed to meet the targets, which means that certain other properties which are lower down in the process, they're kind of being neglected at that point, so they could have um, more quality problems in them. So very simple, um, this is just a, a nice summary. So construction quality, it's it's an area of focus, as you could see from the, the first few slides, it was it was something that we get quite a few post-completion defects. And also from the pictures I've just shown, you can see that we get quite a few defects actually during construction that are picked up. So it's an area that, that needs to be focused on. It's not a simple area to fix, and it's caused by many things. And a, a lot of the causes that I've gone through today, they're, they're interlinked. So for example, Contracts could be linked to supervision, could be linked to continuity of trades, and it could be linked to responsibility. Information, again, it could be linked to design changes, could be linked to communication, responsibility, and knowledge. And then program demands, again, they could be linked to materials, supervision, quality assurance, and quality control. And I'm sure that, that you can all think of a, a number of instances where these have um, or a number of different occasions where you've come across some of these and uh, they're, they're problematic. Um, in summary, quality assurance and picking up things like shown in the pictures, that's one part of achieving good quality, but some would argue that's a little bit too late. Um, for me, feedback loops also need to be implemented to share knowledge, lessons and improvement areas in order to stop defects recurring in future. So we need to, if we identify any design defects, we need to feed those back. Any information gaps, we should feed those back. Any contractual arrangements that may have a negative effect on quality, again, feed those back. And any material changes. If, if a particular drawing specifies a material and what's available on site means that you can't actually build to that, again, it should be fed back up the line to make sure it kind of doesn't happen on future sites. But for me, most importantly, quality assurance and feedback, it should form part of a bigger strategy and quality should be seen as part of the uh, company culture, and it should also be considered as important as volume and profit. So it's a very short one from me, so that's me done. And um, hopefully you could hear me towards the end. Okay, brilliant, thank you, Tony. Um, this is the opportunity now, if anybody's got any questions that they'd like to put to Tony, um, or if there's anything earlier on, I know we had the sound issues where perhaps you missed some elements that were being said, um, perhaps we could revise, um, you know, revisit those. But uh, I think the problem is we have a rogue headset <laughs> so we're both using bluetooth headsets one's not working one is so we keep swapping them across the room to each other apologies for that um so what i was saying was questions now the has one come in let's have a quick look now we're going to have to do this quite creatively so if you just give me two seconds to sort out the sound we can do this one moment <laughs> Okay, can you hear me? I cannot hear you. Yes. Okay, so the first question is, do you think there is a case for all builders um, to be registered? For what purposes? For... That's the question. Okay. Um, it could work. It could be similar. It's generally, it's a slightly ambiguous question in as much as for warranty purposes, for any PC builders are registered. Uh, there's a process that's undertaken, but with regards to general trades, mandatory registration, like we have in sort of the gas industry, and also with regards to electrics, could be a way forward to improve quality. 
but it, it kind of needs to form part, part of the bigger yeah. strategy for me. Where it's, it's focusing on getting quality has been important, and uh, quality should be a priority. Most reported issues by homeowners relate to the highest areas of defects discovered. Um, okay, so from a claims point of view, our largest area of claims are to do with, at the moment, is to do with roof mortar. Um, that's not typically something that we, well, we see it as an issue on our construction quality reviews, but it's not one of the largest areas because it's it's probably quite difficult to pick up. Um, the second largest area is to do with external masonry and walls, so damp proof courses and cavity trays. So that, that concords to, to our findings. Um, some of the issues post completion, they are, they are slightly to do with um, the warranty cover. So we have a warranty cover that will cover particular areas and you also need to um, satisfy a minimum claim value. So what we see post completion is is slightly skewed by by our potential warranty cover. Okay. Um, a lot of these defects have been known for a long time. Uh, why are they still occurring? Is it uh, profit versus quality? Um, yeah, as I've as I've touched on, it would. From what we've what we've seen from site managers and, and similar, a lot of these issues they have been going on since well for as long as I can remember anyway. Um, I would suspect that quality is not enough of an area of focus, and at the moment, as I mentioned at the end, it's kind of seen as a, a lesser side. Well, in my opinion, anyway, it's seen as a lesser side of things. So your focus would be on volumes and, and potentially profit as opposed to quality. Okay, let's look at this one. Um, is it part of the problem that homeowners are not as tolerant of minor issues? 30 years ago, people would have perhaps accepted shrinkage cracks, but now everybody wants the perfect house. Okay. Um, in, in my experience and um, working with housing associations and house builders and, and in our claims department, a lot of the issues that people report, they are they are actually defects. They're, they're non-compliance with, with our standards and the, the typical requirements. So yes, people probably are more aware of particular issues, but there are situations, in my experience anyway, where they're reporting what we'd consider to be a genuine defect. So I think that just, just generally, quality may be, may be suffering at the moment as we increase volumes. Great, thank you. And um, I've been asked, is NHBC quality guidance available? Indeed, all of our standards are available through um, our website. So if you go onto nhbc.co.uk, click on the, the standards link on the, um, on the main homepage, and then you'll go into an area called Tech Zone, and that's where we've got free access to our standards and requirements. Um, okay, there's loads of questions coming in, so <laughs> just let me have a quick look through. Um, have the amount of defects gone up since NHBC do both the warranty and the building control inspections? I don't believe so. I think that our claims experience show that defects post-completion are going down. Um, and our, our reportable items, I, I think that they, they remain relatively stable. So I don't think there's any kind of issue with that. And do registered training um, sort of courses and systems like MVQs, do you think they teach detail correctly? Um, I'll talk about universities as well. So some of the work that, that me and my, my team that I, I work in are doing, we're working with academic um, institutions so I've been going around to various uh, universities and colleges talking about construction quality and I find that there are there is a bit of a concern with regards to technical detailing knowledge of, of particular areas of construction and that is definitely in my opinion something that could be improved so people could get more experience and they could in my opinion anyway be better taught as to um, 
to what's required, where to get information, and then that should hopefully make them more knowledgeable of what should be done. Great, thank you. I'm putting you right on the spot here with all these. Um, another one that's come in, should we move to dry ridge systems as water is not super glue? Okay, um, I, I think that, that looking at it, a lot of builders have moved to, uh, to dry fix systems. Um, so that's something that is moving. I think there's a, a decent amount of guidance out there on it now. But fundamentally, the issues we see to do with roof mortar is where it's not been done correctly. Okay, um, just a question. Do you think builders should have a driving license style document? that confirms their ability to carry out work? What do you think to that sort of idea? Again, that, that links um, kind of to the, the gas safe and also the electrical installation stuff. Um, it is an idea that's been, been floated around for a while. I think that anything like that to, um, to improve people's knowledge could help. But again, it's about bringing in change and also bringing in that quality, to, that um, focus to get stuff correct. Okay, do you, do you know, does the, do you, sorry, does the government intend to bring in any legislation that you're aware of to ensure that the required standards are achieved and ensure reliance is taken away from warranty or building control inspectors? There is. Uh, sorry, go on. Yeah, there's, there's nothing that I'm aware of, but that's not to say that, that it won't happen. But that is something that I can, I can definitely check and get back to you if needed. Okay, and kind of similarly to one, to one asked before, that are modern methods of construction part of the problem with quality? Um, it's kind of counter to the, to the regular argument to do with modern methods of construction. The argument tends to be that there is potential for them to increase quality because a lot of the work is done in factory conditions. But I think that these sort of systems, they may just offer different challenges and at the moment, we're at a point where we, we don't particularly know. And uh, would you agree that the client is often giving contractors now unrealistic programmes, which can then lead to mistakes, misinformation, and then rush works? And if you do think that is the case, how can that potentially stop occurring? Okay, that does link relatively nicely into um, to some of the comments that we've received speaking to people. And... Yes, that may may appear to be the case. And with all of these things, it's about making quality an area of focus and an area of importance. So it's about a change in culture to, to make sure that you get stuff right. Um, just picking up um, more, more of a comment, really, um, that perhaps disappointing that the industry still has so many problems with quality and needs to, you know, look at that going forward with training and, and continuous improvement, that must be the key. Yeah, I, I agree to an extent. Sorry, just going through because there's a lot of questions coming in. This one. Okay, um, just picking up here, one defect is not the same as another. Um, for example, a leaking roof is not the same as a leaking tap. Um, does the NHBC publish the cost of these repairs as opposed to the number? Um, yeah, the, the amount we spend on claims is available in our um, annual report. And we also, through publications such as Technical Extra, will provide a breakdown of, of typical defects we see from both a, a volume perspective and also, also a cost perspective. Okay, and what options are available um, if builders continue to fall below NHBC standards? Well, what we try to do is we try to work with the house building industry to, to raise quality. And we have, as I mentioned before, developed new initiatives such as construction quality reviews in order to, to help improve quality. And that's, um, that's been at some cost to ourselves, but we are there to try and raise standards to, to protect homeowners. Okay, and uh, bear with me, we've got a long question here, but how should quality in construction be assessed? One of the challenges for builders that aim to raise standards is a lack of measurement for the extra quality they produce. 
So building codes and building standards specify the minimum standard, but there is no incentive to exceed them. We have this quite a lot about the minimum mm -hmm. being what people aim towards rather than try to exceed. Um, so really, what are your thoughts on that? My, my thoughts on that are that um, at this moment on, in time, uh, the minimum is not being achieved in certain situations, as you'd seen from some of the pictures that we show. So I think that, that at the moment before we actually raise standards from a making them harder, making them better point of view, we need to make sure that those who are not achieving the current minimum requirements need to be brought up to the right level. Okay, and have you noticed sites struggling to source good trades or have you noticed a lack of competition between trades and do you think that affects quality? I think that there are there are certain trades where, in my experience anyway, there is a lack of availability of them and I think that that, that does often, in my opinion anyway, um, lead to potential a reduction in quality. And kind of on a similar vein, you've got, um, is part of the issue um, the number of subcontractors rather than direct employees? Again, this does link to, to some of the, the quotes that I went through that yes sometimes it is hard that lack of um, continuity might mean that it's harder to tell people exactly what you want um, and what you require and also make it so that there's less accountability um, so possibly so Adrian's asked how many NHBC warranty inspections are made on typical new build projects each project we will typical one will inspect at five key stages and they're all available on our, on our um, website, all of that information is. And uh, being asked, do you find the same problems with smaller builders on one stroke two plot sites as you would perhaps with a, a larger development? Possibly not, because I think they're under different pressures. Sure, and um, finally, could you repeat the website's name about quality control requirements? There's a question that's coming through. Okay, so so our one, it's nhbc.co.uk, and then on our homepage, you'll see a link to all of our standards and, and stuff like that. And also, if you're interested with regards to construction quality reviews, if you go to nhbc.co.uk forward slash CQR, and that'll provide all the information. Excellent. Well, thank you. That was a very, very good um, question session. Now, they're still coming in. <laughs> Let me just have a look. No, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, right. What I'll do there is we'll leave it there. If I can grab that headset back. <laughs> okay, hopefully you should all be able to hear me loud and clear now. So, again, thank you very much for joining us this morning session. Um, apologies again regarding the sound issues, and thank you very much for all getting in touch and letting me know you're having problems. I've never felt so popular. Um, and huge thanks to Tony for his expertise this morning. And again, I say a very, very good question um, and answer session this morning. So we'd just like to bring your attention to your next webinar, which will take place on Wednesday, the 28th of March. We're looking at flood risk modeling and management. Now, for those of you who have already um, registered to attend, you may have noticed a quick date change for it. Now, that was due to speaker availability, so we've obviously had to move it back a couple of weeks. Um, but if you do want to join us, there'll be a link sent to you in the email that you're going to get um, after this as a follow-up. Um, if there are any further questions that you want um, forwarding to Tony, that's absolutely fine. As I say, pop them through to info at cbld.com, or you'll get my email address again in the follow-up. You've probably most of got it already, so just throw those over to me and I will forward them on. Um, but again, thank you for your time. Thank you for joining us and we will see you online next time. Thank you.